It's 201. Happy Friday and congratulations to everyone who made it this far. It's difficult to hold focus for 30 minutes, let alone five days. So give yourself a pat on the back as you round out the final or the finale of this challenge, which is going to be a bit of a twofer. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of going to give you two big takeaways today that will make everything that you do easier from here on out. So we've got the plan, we've got the training, the food, we've got the schedule, the organization, the 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 nuts and bolts all laid out. And today I'm going to share with you the the number one factor in your success uh, over time, over the long term. And I'm also going to share with you my five pillars of metabolic function that uh, is how I help people get twice the results and half the work. And, uh, you know, if you could take a drug, and a lot of people do, <laughs> if you could take a drug that gets you double the results with every curl, most of us would take that drug, as long as there's no side effects, take it every day. And I'll show you, I'll share with you how you can do that. So uh, the, the purpose of today's talk is to um, drive home the probably the most obvious yet underrated and underobserved phenomenon in health and fitness. And funny enough, there's lots of books um, lately that have been published about it. This book is called Connected by... Nicholas Christakis Christakis and James Fowler. So this book uh, is a wonderful read. It talks about the power of social networks and it, it describes over the course of seven chapters how most of the outcomes in your life, health, wealth, happiness, uh, longevity, uh, all kinds of um, outcome-based factors are heavily influenced by the people in your social network, the people that are close to you, the people that that appear with you in photos and social media, the people that are your are inside of what the author describes as your five closest relationships. So today, I want you to write out the people the five closest relationships that you have in your life, take a, take a moment right now, pen them out. They could be family, they could be friends, they could be peers, they could be coworkers. So the the how do, how do you rate how close you are with somebody? It's there's going to be a function of time. How much time have you spent with them? and proximity, like how physically close you are, how how much of, of your day-to-day -day are they familiar with, and how much of their day-to-day -day are you're familiar with. So um, co-contextualization. So time, proximity, and co-contextualization, co to use a very scientific word. So I'm going to give you about 30 more seconds to pen out top five and there's not going to be a quiz and you don't have to share them. So I want you to just understand them. And I want you to take the moment, actually do the exercise, which is why you're here. And once you've done that, I want you to notice the commonalities that you have with them. What do you have in common them in common with them health wise? What do you have in common with them wealth wise, in terms of personal income and financial literacy? I mean, now you can't obviously we can't know what everyone's life is like behind closed doors, um, but this is your just guesstimate. What 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 about their overall happiness, their mental health, their satisfaction with personal relationships? So once you've written those down, if you're like me, you might have a mixed bag. You might have some heavy commonality with some of them. You might 
uh, a few of them might be uh, a carryover from a previous era in your life, maybe a best friend or a family member that you used to have a lot in common with or spend a lot of time with and you don't anymore. That's okay. But the, the, the purpose of this exercise is to, to note whether or not these are these relationships are with people that you have the that have the desired outcomes that you want. So do, do you want to share values with them? Do you do you are these the values that you want? Are these the people with the um, worldview that co are you is it fun to co contextualize with them? Or do you find them a net energy drain? That's a that's another question. And the reason why this is so important is because not because they're they're going to help you with your your fitness goals, but the relationships that you identify in this in this uh, through this exercise are the relationships that are going to have the biggest impact on your energy day to day, on your willingness to do the work, and and if you share your goals and dreams and vision with them, they're these people are going to be the ones that are going to hold you accountable in a way that is in alignment with your goals and with your identity. So the topic of today's talk was about accountability. And now is a good time to throw in a definition. Um, a lot of times accountability gets thrown out at people as though it's some sort of a punishment to be held accountable. It's almost like a threat in many cases, right? We we don't want to be held accountable. They don't want to hold themselves accountable. It sometimes is used that way. Um, that becomes a, it, it's almost like our culture has a fear relationship with responsibility and accountability. But the reality is accountability is just the, uh, the process of us receiving the consequences of our actions the consequences of the energy that we put out in the world and the consequences of the uh, responsibilities we have and have not taken full ownership of. So accountability is just a, it's almost like a reconciliation process where you come to grips with the work that you have or haven't done. And, you know, if you're a parent, Sometimes you can get held accountable for other people's actions. You know, uh, I remember breaking many things when I was a kid and my mom having to clean up my messes and sometimes uh, pay for products to be replaced, uh, depending on whether I was throwing rocks at someone's window or, you know, getting up to any level of mischief when I was a kid. So accountability doesn't always, isn't, doesn't always generate from something that you do um, directly, but it can also be an indirect um an indirect process. So the people that you are closest to, when you share with them what you're trying to do, they're going to, to some degree, at least at this point, they're going to reflect back to you the kind of accountability that they're capable of. And they're going to, just the fact that the people that you care about know, know what you care about and what you're committed to, just that idea alone will create a little bit of gravity to the commitments and the decisions that you make. So all it takes is for you to get a text from one of these people in your top five saying, hey, how's the running going? And that will drive home the level of accountability that you have with them because if you're anything like me and you are because you're someone who cares about your health and fitness and you're passionate, when you're when someone reminds you of a task you have not yet completed, that puts just a little bit more pressure that ratchets up the, the tension just a little bit. So that's a good thing. So the people in your in your top five are your most easily uh, most easy and readily available sources of accountability and i challenge you to bring them in on your your health project your commitment to yourself i challenge you to say to say out loud to them or text them 
hey, I'm. it's really important to me to become a runner or to start strength training or insert your goal. And um, I'm committing to starting today. So just so you know, I'm working out twice a week or whatever the process is. So ask me about it whenever you get the chance. Just that alone, they're going to know that that's important. They're going to know that you're important. And the next time that you have that, you have a conversation with them, it might come up and watch the, the level of pressure rise. Now, there are people that, uh, that if you're, if you wrote a minus next to anyone's name, someone who's an energy taker, you might have this relationship with somebody where uh, they don't believe in you. They um, think it's a bad idea, whatever you're trying to do, or that it somehow takes away from your relationship with them. And that is a conversation for another day. But if that is the relationship that you have, I wouldn't lean on that person for your accountability and support. I'd go to one of the plus signs on the list. Now, if I haven't covered it yet, which I don't think I did. So to go back the top five, I want you to add a plus sign next to that person's name. If every time you talk to them, you leave with more energy than you left with, or than you than you started with, write, write a plus sign. And if you don't do that, then it's a minus. Even if it's a net neutral, we're gonna write a minus because they're not adding anything to your life and your conversation. So you wanna lean on the pluses and you wanna stay away from the minuses. Okay, forgot that critical piece. Now, this is vulnerable, right? Telling people what's important to you, asking them to show up for you, that is a, an act of vulnerability. So most people aren't willing to do it because they're afraid of letting other people down or failing in front of people. That's perfectly normal and that's perfectly okay. I also, if you feel that way, if you feel that that might be you, then it's even more important to reach out because people will appreciate your vulnerability. People will appreciate the fact that you shared something with them. And that, that makes you a little bit more human, a little bit less of a superhero to them. And then they'll that will deepen your connection with them. So if you're feeling a little bit anxious about this task, then this is the most important one for you. Okay, so that was the that was the lesson of your top five. And this is still on the topic of accountability. So we're gonna take it one layer deeper, and uh, I want to uh, uh, get through everything I have with including the five pillars. So I'll tell a short story about a time that I learned something I didn't know before. I uh, went to see my friend play the piano and she's a really wonderful music musician. So I went to some of her live shows and I arrived a little bit early to one show at, uh, uh, at a pizza shop. And there was another speaker um, at doing a Q and a, apparently he just had a presentation and I sat in and I listened and it was a, a skinhead recruiter who used to do recruitment for uh, an air, a gang, actually the Aryan Nation, which was a big conglomerate of skinhead gangs in the 80s and 90s. And he'd, he'd written a book while he was in prison about uh, what it was like to recruit people into this criminal organization. And he talks about uh, how to recruit young men and get them into his... Um, and his cohort. And one of the audience members asked a very good question. Um, how do you select the, the young men? How do you know they're going to be a good fit for your gang? What, what characteristics do you look for? And he said that everyone is a good fit. Every young person is a good fit if they don't have any adults in their life that care about them. So if if somebody's running around after school with no older brother, no, no, the parents aren't making them come home for, for dinner. If they're kind of free to do whatever, and they're just willy nilly, then he has a sign. That's a sign that, that no one's looking after this kid. 
And then they'll take a step further. He'll he'll ask them about church or ask them about community organizations. And, and if they say that they, they don't go to church or they say that they, they don't really like church, then he starts to get his talons in. And uh, he revealed that all it took was for one adult to really take an interest in this person's young person's life. And that would dissolve their relationship because as soon as you, you know, run your skinhead ideas by a, uh, a you know, a, a pastor or a youth pastor, a teacher, as soon as you, you know, you, you, you start talking out loud about any of this stuff, someone's going to correct you. They're going to be worried about you. They're going to engage. Right. But if you're not doing that, if no one's engaging with you, then it's, it's a, that's a, that's a fallow field and ripe for sowing. The lesson that I took away was the more isolated we are, the more vulnerable we are. And all it takes is one positive supportive relationship to change everything in your life. And uh, I got to experience this firsthand. I was a young man who was, didn't have a lot of people, um, you know, in my immediate family who cared about me, but I had lots of adults in my life who really were interested in my success. My grandfather being the biggest one, but I had others as well. You know, it took, takes a village. But as I think back, that's what gave me the, the subconsciously, that's what gave me the moral compass to continually make different decisions and learn from my mistakes is I had people who truly cared about me. So how does this apply to you? You're an adult, ostensibly. Lots of people care about you. You have jobs, bosses. You have people in your life and family. Okay. Well, the having somebody maybe in the top five, maybe uh, a friend, maybe somebody who has a, a, a invested interest in your health and your life and doesn't need anything from you. That's kind of a key key factor. It doesn't need anything from you. This is why friends, uh, annoying friends who are into fitness are kind of good because uh, they they you're not paying their rent. You're you're gonna they love you no matter what. They're not your spouse or significant other, but they they will be checking on you and they care about your ultimate success. And uh, the same could be said for a teacher or a coach. Uh, you know, any anybody who is an adult outside of you who doesn't need you for anything is a good, powerful, supportive relationship for any process of change. Uh, so, again, if that uh, if that sparked anything inside of you, that's a great opportunity to connect with the people in your network, to be vulnerable to take a risk, to reach out. And you'll be amazed at the power that comes into your life when you do that. And they say in, um, I think it's a Buddhist parable or a Chinese proverb, uh, a burden shared is a burden halved. So as soon as you connect with somebody about what you're going through, everything gets easier. All right. So that's the that's the accountability and social connectivity aspect of taking on a change process. And I think I think that's all I have to say about that. Um, I'll post this in the Facebook group. If there's any follow up questions, we can talk about it there um, or maybe a comment on the YouTube video. I don't know. But. I want to share with you the five. I'm just getting a little some AI feedback here. I really love it. The five, the five pillars of metabolic function. Now, I uh, was I was talking to a, a young man yesterday who asked me how I knew I wanted to be a health coach, and I told him the story, which I hadn't thought about in this these terms before. But being a young strength coach and personal trainer, I realized that a lot of the things that people needed to be truly successful were happening outside of the gym. Now I could coach a perfect squat, a perfect deadlift, kettlebell swing, all of those things. But if they weren't doing the um, the important things outside of the gym, eating right, 
getting great sleep, um, you know, doing their movement prep, the things that that made them function better, then they wouldn't get as good results. So I started working on the coaching aspect to try and influence the performance of the athletes even more. So I, over the course of 15 years and lots of study and trial and error and book reading, I've come up with the five pillars, these five factors that are going to have the, they're the biggest levers. They're going to have the biggest impact on your health and fitness goals. And I'm going to share them with you in no particular order, except for there is a particular order. Um, <laughs> um, but you, you've learned about many of these already. These are, these are uh, pillars and these are fundamental principles that I go over in great detail in my course, Metabolic Restoration. But uh, for right now, here's what I want you to write down. Pillar number one training and movement movement support so anything that you do cardiovascular conditioning strength training um you know sports most exercise falls into the training and movement category then there's recovery movement so mobility stretching physical therapy any activity breathing drills Activity that stimulates the parasympathetic nervous system. So it's just the other half of your nervous system. So uh, strength training and, and cardiovascular conditioning is the sympathetic nervous system. The parasympathetic nervous system is the opposite side of that coin or the, the, the yin to the yang. So that recovery movement process is how you stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system, which releases those recovery hormones, which speeds up in the process of you getting the adaptation to the training that you're doing, right? Healing versus adaptation, video two, I believe. Third pillar is sleep. This is a whole, I mean, book, books have been written about all these, but I'm distilling it down to the most fundamental pieces. Sleep, specifically REM, you know, REM sleep and your quality of REM sleep and deep sleep or SWS sleep which those two, those two sleep modes are where you do the most restorative work cognitively and physiologically in your, in your body every evening. So maximizing the value of your sleep, the sleep efficiency, the, the sleep consistency, all of those things. But the quality of your sleep and the quantity of your sleep is a huge impact, not just on your results in your fitness program, but on your mental health and your physical health down the road and your longevity. Obviously food, it's the third pillar. One, two, three, four, fourth pillar. Food, what you eat, how much you eat and how you eat that food. Talked a lot about macronutrients, micronutrients, food hygiene, eating hygiene. This is the way that you consume the environment and with the context in which you consume your food. All those are in that food pillar, which is the fourth pillar, very important. Um, again, whole 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 books, whole book sections of bookstores are just about nutrition and food. And then the fifth pillar is um, they're almost they're all the most important. Everything's the most important. Right. The fifth pillar is change management and emotional regulation, i.e., stress. So it's how you manage the process of shifting all these variables around in your life, the when to change them, how to change them, and how to deal with the discomfort and uncertainty inside of all those. And that has to do with intra, intrapersonal conversation and interpersonal conversation with the people in your life and how you communicate this stuff. So this is a lot on, you know, what is how do you emotionally regulate? How do you schedule? How do you get how do you have discipline with yourself? All of these, you know, your personal integrity, all of these would follow under that fifth column, which is change management, emotional regulation, or stress for a shorthand. So those are the five biggest levers, five pillars of metabolic function. And those messing with those levers, using those, those high leverage parts of your health and fitness are, are really going to be how you maximize the results and you feel the best which is what I want for each and every one of you for having gone through the challenge. I want you to feel your best, look your best, 
Uh, I want you to make the world a better place by being a happier and healthier person. So if you're wondering what to do now, number one, congratulations, you finished all the videos. If you've gotten to the, the end of video five, you've watched all five videos. You've listened to me talk for you know 100 years at this point. Did you fill out your schedule? Did you chart your exercise? Did you fill out your meal plan? Did you reach out to people to build your accountability group, your community? Did you uh, set your goals, which is the first thing, the objective? Did you have your objective filled out? If you haven't, stop what you're doing. Don't do anything else. Go back and watch those videos, do the worksheets, do the exercises, get ready, because you can't succeed unless you have all of those things in place. Those are those are prerequisites for your success. And then when you do that, number one, send me an email. Tell me how you like this program. Tell me what you got from it. Tell me what you wish it would have covered. Wish you wish it would have had. And um, and then tell me, yeah, what you got from it. What you wish it would have. What you could have got from it. And then tell me how I can improve to make this better and a better experience for everyone involved. And that could be something technical, something content-wise, some ideas that I didn't share or explain, um, anything you wanted more of. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear about it. I hope to have many people go through this process so that they can get clarity and, and get great power in their health and fitness and ultimately um, feel and look their absolute best. That's my goal. Thank you so much for going through this with me. I appreciate it. It's been a fun journey for me. And I'm excited to see all the great things you create in the in the weeks and months to come. And here's to you bringing forth the warrior within. Nobody had any questions, right? Good. Ha ha ha. Thanks, Kayla.